The smallest deed is better than the greatest intention. Like the foundation he laid for the naturalists and transcendentalists who followed, this quote of John Burroughs is fairly well known. Surprisingly enough, its author isn't. John Burroughs' exploration of the natural world and his public exchange of opinions concerning environmental conservation helped the common man encounter and appreciate nature through a local lens. His influence on powerful social figures, including President Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Ford, encouraged the protection and celebration of nature throughout the country. Burroughs was born on April 3, 1837, at his family's Catskill Mountains farmstead in Delaware County, New York. He spent his childhood working the farm, attending his local school, and exploring his family's extensive homestead. Burroughs attended Beechwood Seminary in Roxbury until 16 when he graduated. He was slow, some said dull-witted, and an indifferent student forever distracted by the antics of an insect or some other minor spectacle of nature. Jay Gould, who would become a great financier, was Burroughs' closest friend throughout school. Gould assisted Burroughs many times with his schoolwork. A Washington Post article recounts the story of Gould's friendly aid. When Burroughs had difficulty composing anything worthy of his teacher's eyes, Gould took his slate and quickly composed a few lines, saving Burroughs from what he thought was certain penalty. The seminary schoolmaster, James Oliver, was a young teacher who inspired his students. Burroughs recalls, Under Mr. Oliver, we acquired a genuine love of learning. Burroughs' original inspiration may have stemmed from an encounter with Oliver. Schoolmasters of that time, including Oliver, boarded round with the families of their pupils, alternating every few weeks. While Oliver was staying with the Burroughs family, he hiked to the top of Old Clump, a summit Burroughs would later write about, and returned with a fox skull. Upon return, Oliver sat down and immediately wrote a poem about the skull. In a later letter to Oliver, Burroughs wrote, the notion that something, anything, on my home mountain could inspire a real poem, actual literature, was a revelation. Oliver's influence over him would lay the foundation for Burroughs' future as a naturalist. When Burroughs first started writing, he encountered difficulties in getting a start, and even an accusation of plagiarism. His early papers were inspired by much of Ralph Waldo Emerson's work. He was initially obsessed with Emerson's writings, and when he submitted his first nature essay, Expression, the essay appeared so Emersonian that the editor asked Emerson himself if the essay was his. Burroughs was so affected by this incident that in all of his future works, he deliberately wrote of place to differentiate his work from that of Emerson. This theme of place in Burroughs' writings was the local lens through which others could explore nature, on their own terms and in their own backyards. By simply identifying a tree, or flower, or bird, his followers could connect to nature and understand its value as Burroughs did. Another aspect of his local lens was the area of nature he chose to focus on. Unlike the other well-known naturalists of that era, Burroughs favored the spirited commotion of the small creatures on his own farmstead at Riverby, rather than the imposing majesty of remote mountain ranges. As he put it, the place to observe nature is where you are, the walk to take today is the walk you took yesterday. Burroughs' knowledge was so admired, he was chosen as the historian to join 23 scientists for the Edward Harriman expedition to Alaska in 1899. His explorations also included a yearly camping trip with Henry Ford, Harvey Firestone, and Thomas Edison. The men, dubbed the Four Vagabonds by the press, enjoyed a thoughtful exchange of political and environmental ideas on these trips. The Vagabonds' trips became so famous that crowds of over a thousand people lined the streets when the four passed through, forming a parade for the campers. 
Ultimately, these tranquil outings were discontinued because the four were regularly interrupted by the paparazzi of that time. At a time when popular belief was that nature should be conquered and tamed, naturalists argued that nature was to be celebrated and protected. Burroughs was a leader of the naturalist movement, quietly promoting the conservation of nature during a time of rapid expansion and industrialization. In 1912, Burroughs wrote, we can use our scientific knowledge to improve and beautify the earth, or we can use it to poison the air, corrupt the waters, blacken the face of the country, and harass our souls with loud and discordant noises, or we can use it to mitigate or abolish all these things. Long before scientists discovered the extensive negative effects of air and noise pollution in the mid-20th century, John Burroughs was warning people of the harm the Industrial Revolution would bring to the environment. John Burroughs' passion for preservation inspired many, including President Roosevelt, who ultimately ended the heated Nature Fakers controversy that Burroughs had started five years earlier. The public dispute began when Burroughs published the article, Real and Sham Natural History, in the March 1903 edition of the Atlantic Monthly. The article called out writers Ernest Thompson Seton, William Joseph Long, and Jack London for giving animals fictional human-like attributes in their books. Burroughs described their alleged non-fiction works as yellow journalism of the woods. The New York Times, along with much of the public, backed Burroughs' statements that the men were taking advantage of their popularity and writing skills to fool the people with those nature myths. After intense and widely publicized debate, Roosevelt's article, Nature Fakers, in which he sided with Burroughs, brought an end to the argument. Burroughs also encouraged the president to preserve the nation's untouched natural lands. Because both Burroughs and Roosevelt shared a specific love of birds, Roosevelt was inspired to establish 51 federal bird reserves throughout the country. In addition to bird reservations, Roosevelt created five national parks and 150 national forests, totaling 230 million acres of preserved land still enjoyed by visitors today. Upon his death, the New York Times ran a full front page obituary, including his final words, How far are we from home? Burroughs' funeral was attended by Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and President Roosevelt. The John Burroughs Association has awarded a medal each year since Burroughs' death to the author of a distinguished book of natural history. Recognized authors include Rachel Carson, who won in 1952 for her book, The Sea Around Us, and Aldo Leopold, who was awarded the medal posthumously for his esteemed book, A Sand County Almanac. Leopold and Carson went on to play a large role in starting the environmental movement that is still happening today. Some of Burroughs' most notable contributions were his nature essays, which established this form of writing as a means of appreciating and engaging with nature that continues to inspire readers and activism today. His 23 volumes popularized the nature essay, with over a million and a half copies sold in his lifetime. The essays were also widely read by school children in the classroom. Because he was so specific and tangible in his writings, readers were able to relate to his ideas and experience for themselves what exactly Burroughs was writing about. His celebration of common wildlife allowed readers to connect his theories to their own natural environments. Burroughs' encounters led him to make decisions that affected who he would become as a naturalist and author, and his exchange of ideas and perspectives pushed his thought and work to new levels. Though some other naturalists of his time are now household names, such as John Muir, Henry David Thoreau, and Emerson, John Burroughs and his work are forgotten by many. Even so, his theories and words live on, influencing modern environmentalists and the common man decades after his death. As President Theodore Roosevelt said to Burroughs, it is a good thing for our people that you should have lived.